So just to let you know that we are recording uh, the presentation and it will be available on our website um, once we've uh, uploaded it. So I hope you're OK with that. Um, and then over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Liz. Hi, all. Great to be with you. And uh, um, as, uh, as as Liz says, I, I, I my name's Mark. I um, represent Plant Life International. And um, what I hope to devote the next few minutes to is uh, a, a presentation on uh, how nature based solutions can be part of how we not only enhance uh, and conserve biodiversity on road verges and our publicly accessible green spaces, uh, which are also very relevant to this presentation, but how we can also um, deliver cost savings and benefit uh, the climate uh, as well. So um, I'm happy to take questions afterwards um, and uh, please forgive me if I press on at pace because there's quite a few uh, slides to get through. But um, first of all, it's worth asking just how much how, how much of an asset do we have just purely with regard to to, to road verges? And the total area in Great Britain adds up to some 2,600 square kilometres, 260,000 hectares. Uh, and uh, when you add that all up together, that's 1.2% of the total land area of Great Britain. It's 4% of our urban areas. It's about the size of Dorset. It's a whole county's worth of land, if you like, hidden in plain sight either side of us when we're making use of our highways and byways. The strategic road network accounts for nearly a fifth of that, so the motorways and trunk A roads, and about 70% of our road verges are made up of grassland. Next slide, please. Plant Life has done some work which has shown that over 700 species of wildflower grow on our, our verges, and that accounts for nearly half of our total plant diversity including 87 species which, given their trends, are a threat of extinction. And uh, in fact, if you compare the total amount of roadside grassland to the area of what's categorised as priority uh, semi-natural grassland, then roadside grassland is about 80% of that in area. Now, um, that means that any effort to manage road verges and road, roadside grassland better for wildlife could have a huge impact on conserving grassland as a habitat. And that's something that's of deep concern to charities uh, like Plant Life, biodiversity conservation organisations, because we've lost over 97% of our species rich grassland uh, over the last century or so. Next slide, please. And it's not just plants that benefit uh, from um, uh, road verges. Work uh, by Plymouth University recently has found that uh, invertebrates, pollinators, bumblebees uh, benefit from well-managed road verges. Uh, it's been found that uh, reliably uh, the, the, the habitat uh, on the roadside of hedgerows compared to the field side is much better for bumblebees and the plants that support bumblebees. So there's every opportunity um, to manage road verges and similar public green spaces for pollinators too. Next slide, please. And you could picture a cross section of, of any road or, road or thoroughfare as a series of parallel stripes of different habitat type. Work by uh, Plant Life has found that it's, next slide please, the, the grassy parts of road verges and the hedgerows if they're native species, uh, which in combination represent the greatest amount of biodiversity. That's the winning combination if they're sympathetically managed for wildlife. They'll benefit pollinators, they'll benefit our winter thrushes now arriving with northerly and easterly winds um, looking for wild fruit. Um, and uh, that is where we could concentrate our um, vegetation management to enhance and conserve our wildlife. Next slide, please. So there arguably could be um, lost opportunities for wildlife when we look at the frequently mown parts of our, our, our road verge network. Some uh, over a quarter of our road verges uh, is managed as short, frequently mown grassland, almost like a roadside lawn. And 56% of those lawn verges are in urban areas inside our 30 mile an hour zones. So um, of, of all the lawn verges, nearly two thirds of them are of substantial width, over two metres wide, which presents a good opportunity if mowing were changed to be slightly less often and perhaps later in the year to support more wildlife, more flowers and more wildlife that those flowers support. 
Next slide, please. Now, take a breath, then take in these big numbers. If you stretch out all the wiggles in the map and lay our roads end to end, the total length of Great Britain's road uh, roads uh, actually adds up to greater than um, 10 times uh, the equator, 10 times the, the circumference of the Earth, and um, it, it's actually further than the distance the, the moon ever reaches from us as it orbits around us. So that's simply to stress that there is a huge asset out there, not just in area, but also in potential ecologically functional connecting corridors across our landscape. So next slide, please. What we could envisage is that road verges and like strung pearls along that, that, that network are publicly accessible green spaces, all adding up to a green infrastructure. If better managed for wildlife, that can act as a, a healthy vascular system for our living landscape. And it's able to enable um, recolonization by nature of areas that have been damaged. It's able to uh, enable the uh, migration uh, or dispersal of wildlife from areas that are less favorable to areas that are becoming more favorable as we pollute, as we develop, and as climate change progresses. So um, it's worth bearing in mind that networks of uh, public green space don't just act as barriers, but if managed well, can act as connecting corridors for wildlife. Next slide, please. And the drivers for why we arguably should manage uh, road verges and accompanying publicly accessible green space for biodiversity all stem from the 25 year environmental plan, the Environment Act 2021, um, now coming into effect in so many different ways. Um, the 25 year environment plan envisages a nature recovery network, which simply won't exist if we don't take the opportunity to work with linear features like our road verge network in the landscape to enhance that and make it more ecologically functional. Then within the Environment Act, there's a strengthening of those local authority biodiversity duties already in place under the Natural Environment and Rural Communities Act 2006, but now strengthened under the new Environment Act. Biodiversity net gain will soon need to be delivered to offset what can't be uh, avoided or mitigated when biodiversity is lost or damaged, resulting from uh, development. And uh, our green spaces, uh, they can uh, deliver that offset if managed better for wildlife. Local nature recovery strategies are uh, being formulated and will soon come into effect under the Act and biodiversity opportunity maps underpin those. Think of um, uh, a geographic information system that highlights parks and road verges that are ways in which wildlife can even ramify urban and peri-urban uh, contexts. And then um, perhaps less um, uh, less apparent are opportunities that come along with uh, the forthcoming legal requirement to separate rotting organic material or putrescible waste from our landfill to reduce, to minimise, to cut out the release of methane into the atmosphere, a very, um, uh, a very, a very uh, dangerous uh, greenhouse gas. Now, with that requirement comes the opportunity to perhaps add into that mix uh, and to create a better environmental fate for not just food waste, but the green cuttings from uh, sympathetic vegetation management that will enable biodiversity uh, gain. And I'll go on to talk about some uh, innovations, technological innovations, uh, and uh, some work that Plant Life is currently involved in with partners that will not only be able to work with securing better fate for our organic wastes, but will find ways in which we can manage our green spaces um, with better effect for our biodiversity, but can deliver carbon footprint reductions as well as cost savings for their management as well. Next, next slide, please. What comes next might sound like a whole list of eco nags, ways in which we, you know, we would recommend you do things, even though it costs more and it's so much more onerous to do. Actually, we want to be able to demonstrate that it's better for the climate and better for the public purse if we work with nature in so many ways. And all we're asking to do is really to look at what, what's missing from the landscape, the wild beasts that are the ancestors of our modern day domesticated livestock would have once grazed and nibbled away 
at the landscape and maintained more open habitats in amongst the trees and the more overgrown shaded areas. And that's where the species of wildflower that need full sunlight that we currently associate with meadows and species rich pasture, that's where they would have occupied a wild landscape. So when, we, when we're calling for better um, management for species rich grasslands, this is what we're trying to replace because we've invented fences in the meantime and domesticated animals. So um, next slide, please. We're, we're faced in the, in the absence of these animals roaming wild and free across our landscape. We're, uh, we're faced with a number of pressures on our public grassland, which reduces its biodiversity. Firstly, it's, it's fair to say that generally speaking, cuts are often taken too frequently or too infrequently. Cuts taken too frequently um, prevent wildflowers from flowering or seeds from setting and, and dispersing. So that interrupts life cycles and um, leads to biodiversity loss. But if cuts are taken too infrequently, then we've lost that big grazing beast from our landscape. We've lost that vital element of disturbance, which maintains that rolling boil of vegetation type. And what will happen is that more competitive plants will succeed one another. Uh, tussocks will form, uh, woody shrubs will start to form scrub, and through them, shade tolerant saplings and trees will grow and eventually we'll end up with woodland. So we'll end up with that species, uh, a loss of that species rich grassland element, which is so important for our biodiversity. Both of those things will lead to biodiversity loss. If we cut our public grasslands, uh, uh, including our verges, it seems to make so much more sense economically to leave the cuttings where we generate them, to leave them in place. But that, of course, leaves a physical barrier through which only the most vigorous uh, uh, plants can punch through. Uh, and, and that has a selective effect, meaning that um, we see more biodiversity loss as a result of that. But if left in place to rot down, then the fertility that the plants drew up from the soil as they grew, then rots back down into that soil, enabling it to accumulate because we have a national fertility pollution problem. It's ammonia coming from uh, intensively reared poultry. It's um, nit nitrous and nit nitrogen rich oxides uh, generated by industry and, and vehicle exhausts. Um, it's, it's a whole host of um, fertility coming out of uh, uh, surplus uh, agricultural um, uh, inputs. Uh, so what we have is a problem where fertility is accumulating unnaturally in our marginal land, our public green space, leading to, well, nettles, head high hogweed, thistles. It's not very safe for road verges when um, it starts to conflict with a safe pullover zone. Uh, it constitutes a fire hazard. If you pull over with a hot lower exhaust, it interferes with your sight lines on approach to junctions and bends. So we have safety in mind when we're advocating that we need to start to address this fertility pollution problem. And a way to do that is to collect the cuttings, which sounds like a big ask, but uh, there's there's a big bonus uh, in in the next few slides. So next slide, please. We've um, Plant Life have worked with the partners you see listed here to update what's called the design manual for roads and bridges, something I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and that sets out a different management approach, which all, aims not only to improve biodiversity value, but could reduce long-term management costs as well. And I'll go on to explain how. Next slide, please. The key element, the principal advice uh, within this, the, this, these best practice guides are that um, wildlife friendly verges don't need to be um, left alone. They, they should be cut. Uh, that's part of their management and maintenance um, is key uh, to, to ensure safety. But you can see here in the suggested management calendar options that it really centers on either one cut uh, after summer has finished or two cuts either side of summer. And when we do cut, we, it's really important to make every practical effort to remove the cuttings where possible. That's a big ask. Uh, and I'll go on to explain that that is achievable. OK, next slide, please. If I can achieve this in my back garden, a flowering lawn, then you also have an option for the keep it short areas. This is cut every four to eight weeks, depending on the fertility, depending on uh, the the, uh, the growth season uh, in that year. And what, of course, it it's full of are the kinds of wildflowers that are used to being grazed and can grow back and keep giving throughout the season. So 
there is an option we can always work with. It doesn't have to be um, knee high meadow. It can be shorter too, and it can still deliver for wildlife uh, as it complements other ki kinds of vegetation structure. Next slide, please. There is a leading example that's set out by Dorset Council, um, work by Phil Sterling uh, and currently by Giles Nicholson, uh, found uh, that when they switched to a cut and collect system across all of their parishes, they were able to reduce the fertility in the soil uh, of their public green spaces, which meant that subsequent regrowth was less in volume and less uh, in, in, in lower in rate, so that they didn't have to cut so frequently in subsequent by half within two to three years, which is possible for lighter soils. They reduced that fertility and the management costs came down consequently by about 45% over five years. That meant that within a five year payback period, they could um, afford what they'd invested in. They could pay back on the new equipment you can see shown there, uh, which was simply depositing the cut material into the hedgerow bases so that the fertility came out of the grassy parts and went into the woody parts or the hedgerow parts. And that that's good, that's good, but Plant Life's advice could improve on that even more. I'll go on to show shortly. Um, the next slide shows a graph of that cost reduction that Dorset, Dorset Council was able to achieve. And you can see how dramatic over the space of within five years, a cut and collect system can um, start to deliver cost savings very dramatically. Next slide, please. Now, what could we do other than dump those grass cuttings into a hedgerow base. Uh, the worst thing to do would be to put it into landfill. That would generate lots of methane, bad for the, the, the atmosphere uh, and greenhouse uh, gases. Um, incineration um, certainly generates uh, lots of greenhouse gases too. Composting still generates carbon dioxide uh, as things decompose in air. Better by far, both economically and for the climate, is anaerobic digestion, often abbreviated to AD, which is basically put uh, uh, an artificial cow stomach. So you can see how if we're cutting, uh, if we're collecting our cuttings and we're digesting them in an artificial stomach, this is starting to emulate that ancient beast that was once maintaining the biodiversity in our in our grassy landscape. Next slide, please. So this is the carbon case for Great Britain's road verges. I've already outlined those that, that drop in mowing costs. An, uh, an according um, a concordant uh, drop in emissions from the machinery that would be used to mow and a five year payback time. But based on calculations we've run uh, and our reading of the scientific literature, we, we, we see that bioenergy from roadside grass could realistically reduce um, the annual domestic heavy goods vehicle emissions by 2% by using the biomethane that's re uh, produced from the grass cuttings to replace diesel. In addition, you could, or rather alternatively, I should say, you could take that biomass and use it to generate electricity, some 800 million kilowatt hours. And that would satisfy the energy requirements, the electricity demand for some 260,000 homes each year. And that's equivalent to some 130 onshore turbines. So then we look at um, how much um, road uh, roadside soils contain, how much carbon they contain. And it turns out that if you increase the biodiversity of the vegetation that grows in soil, you increase its ability to be able to capture and hold on to carbon in the soil. So um, we see that currently 160 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent is locked up in grassland soils on road verges, but we could increase that by uh, an additional 10% realistically, which is equivalent to uh, an eighth of the total annual domestic transport emissions if we were to manage our road verges for biodiversity. An extra carbon capture and lock-in, which is a benefit for climate as well as biodiversity at the same time. Next slide, please. So could biomass harvesting uh, and anaerobic digestion of the cuttings replace the role of the ancient grazing herbivores and deliver better biodiversity, cost savings and climate um, uh, and, ca and carbon reductions for climate. Next slide, please. 
yes, uh, biomass harvesting um, does present a risk to invertebrates. Uh, we could in interrupt life cycles and remove the shelter for wildlife. So it's important to think about how um, uh, we see a new uh, anaerobic digestion feedstock market develop. Uh, how uh, some people might want to exploit that uh, to the detriment of, of, bio, uh, of biodiversity. But what we could do to mitigate that risk is to establish clear maps, uh, clear understanding of where good quality green space is, and then to optimise the management of the best bits while we mainstream this sort of management um, for the rest of the network. We can incorporate incremental and rotational management so that we effectively don't do the same thing everywhere um, at the same time in the same way. Next slide, please. That means that nature will have somewhere to, to, to take sanctuary. And according to citizen science surveys in Lincolnshire, you'll find that about 1% of your network of road verges is designatable uh, in its biodiversity quality. Another 10% might win the silver medal, and that um, could be very restorable if it's managed more sympathetically. But 90%, and here's the business proposition, of that, of that network could be cut and collected for bioenergy as, uh, as part of a biomass harvesting um, uh, programme. And that offers best for biodiversity, uh, and it also delivers biodiversity net gain for the vast majority of the network, linking up the best bits, benefiting the connectivity of nature too. Next slide, please. This is how it might look in cross section with an increasing frequency of biomass harvesting um, towards the road uh, itself or a decreasing frequency of biomass harvesting as you step uh, away from uh, a thoroughfare. And that's where you might in, 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 um, expect an, an increase in the structure uh, and the height of vegetation where it's safe uh, to be taller. Next slide, please. And this is what incremental management can look like in practice. This is a hay crop being taken from a roadside nature reserve, but it, that could also be taken uh, in a single pass by a, a biomass harvesting suction flail, a sanctuary strip there at the base of the hedgerow, very important, which could be cut on rotation every other year for sanctuary. Next slide, please. And this is how it might look in terms of growth and regrowth through the year with two cuts on the lowest quality verges, biomass harvesting, giving a good energy return on energy invested. This period in the middle of the year here between the cuts, allowing for regrowth, reflowering, seed production and peak invertebrate activity as well. Next slide, please. And this is something that we want to try to put across. We can work both for ecological benefit and for the best return on energy invested as well. So if you have a, a, a two cuts a year, um, then this is what's recommended for best results for biodiversity in the scientific literature for the, the, the vast majority of grasslands, except for our nature reserves where we need to be a little more sensitive. But for the vast majority, two cuts a year with collection of the cuttings delivers biodiversity net gain. It just so happens that two cuts a year delivers, if you can see that central bar chart, the blue line with the green arrow there highlighted, the best net uh, energy gain per hectare. And that seems to be a self-regulating situation or a two cut sweet spot, if you like, where there's both business opportunity that's balanced against biodiversity risk. So both win and uh, uh, arguably biodiversity can sustain itself or conservation can pay for itself. Road verge management can wash its own face, so to speak. Next slide, please. Now, there's been um, a series of trials uh, starting in Montgomeryshire in 2006, which determined that um, biomass harvested from road verges can be anaerobically digested and that you can reliably glean more than um, 10 to 11 tonnes of fresh weight of herbaceous biomass per hectare. Next slide, please. Picking up the bat baton and running with it um, in Lincolnshire in 2016, uh, a machine uh, that was bespoke designed, was hired from the continent and working with the partners you see there, the Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust uh, examined the chemical contents of um, the, the, the biomass uh, and found it was all favourable for anaerobic digest digestion, including the, the levels of potential contaminants. And tantalisingly, it found that uh, an anaerobic digestion facility operator 
might well be prepared to pay more for these cuttings than it would cost the person uh, to go out and get those cuttings. So we may even reach operational profit as well as energetic profit as well. Next slide, please. So uh, developments were made in Lincolnshire. Uh, in the following slide, you can see uh, And that uh, was based on a, a decouplable and interchangeable trailer so that um, the, uh, the uptime of the cutter could be maximised. Alison, could you uh, move the slide forward, please? It should be a nice big red machine instead of the, uh, the orange beast you can see there. I think our bandwidth might be struggling. I'll carry on with the presentation uh, and hopefully we can catch up shortly. Can anyone give me a thumbs up if you can still hear me? Liz, could you give me a shout if uh, yep, everything's still yeah, working? Oh, there's a thumbs you. up. Great. OK, I'll carry on. Um, so basically, um, yes, the the kit that uh, you might want to use in public open spaces, of course, is much, um, much smaller in scale. Uh, referring to my own notes, um, basically, um, I would encourage people to view a YouTube video produced during lockdown by the Wales Biodiversity Partnership, which lists impartially a, a range of machines such as the Amazon Profi Hoppers, the Ritex, um, the Grylos, the Trackmasters, which can um, uh, high tip uh, onto uh, high sided trailers uh, and could uh, pre present a really good um, range of options for uh, cutting and collecting from green spaces on a smaller scale and indeed from road verges on uh, on the flat on the level uh, within urban and, and peri-urban areas. Uh, then there's a slide I really wanted to move on to, which is a, a, a flow diagram uh, of uh, um, basically the technology illustrates the technology um, behind a bid that Plant Life is currently involved in. We're currently working with two local authorities, West Sussex County Council and South Gloucestershire Council. And uh, we're combining that technology of anaerobic digestion with something called hydrochar production, which is a form of pyrolysis or charcoal production, if you're familiar with that which um, can accommodate a whole range of inputs from food waste through the kind of grass cuttings and uh, curbside uh, garden green waste collections right through to woody material that could be from hedgerow management, ash dieback processing, etc. Uh, and, uh, and forestry. And that whole range of material can find a sustainable environmental fate once it's gone through a combined process of AD, anaerobic digestion and hydrochar. And to finish off, that would uh, result in a sustainable source of fertility for cropland. Of course, we're working with biomass harvesting from marginal lands so that doesn't militate in any way against crop production. Uh, in fact, it's helping to recycle fertility. And then we're able to use the biomethane to fuel. Um, great, there's that process flow. Um, then we're able to use the biomethane, uh, you can see bottom right, to fuel the machinery that goes out and cuts this material in the first place that's started to contribute to a much more circular economy. Um, we can also warm up uh, the asphalt for repairing roads and the char, that hydrochar, that charcoal-like substance that can be produced. It um, captures all the microplastics, it uh, attaches itself to, it adsorbs the heavy metals and it denatures the polyaromatic hydrocarbons or the black uh, nasties that come out of vehicle exhausts. And it um, therefore means that um, you, that could be incorporated into asphalt, which arguably is a longer term carbon capture and lock in uh, than uh, growing wood in the form of trees. That is um, a way in which you could say, you know, the mowers feed themselves and the road actually grows itself, meaning that the highways uh, themselves almost become an ecosystem where they are energetically much more self-sufficient, financially um, much more circular. And uh, what we're hoping to see is uh, an ability uh, for uh, an, an, an economic uh, facility to enable broad scale, landscape scale um, management of our uh, public green spaces um, for wildlife that pays for itself. Final slide, please. And what uh, plant life um, are basically hoping to do um, in the future now that we've run a campaign, uh, increasing people's awareness and understanding of 
is we want to create that space to share learning and showcase um, local authorities progress. Um, this will ex extend into uh, other green spaces too. Um, we're working currently with associations of um, local governments uh, such as APSI, such as uh, ADEPT, uh, LG TAG, etc. And what we're uh, hoping to do is uh, take on an increasingly supportive role that enables, empowers, facilitates officers in their roles within local authorities to deliver the societal benefits that all join up when we, we deliver better green spaces for people, for climate and for wildlife as well. Thank you very much. Apologise for the, uh, uh, the technical hitch there. A couple of questions came through in chat. I'm just going to read those. If we have time to answer, I'm happy to answer. Yes, please go ahead and answer those in the chat. Great. So, S Susan, thank you for your uh, question. Um, you're leading uh, a verge management transformation project. Love the sound of that. There are a number of issues uh, to resolve, aren't there? Just um, but here are two. I wonder uh, what you might advise. Is the cut and collect machinery currently available? Robust? Uh, yes. Short answer. Uh, uh, and it can be cost effective in the sense that the small stuff can pay for itself, as Dorset demonstrates within five years. The large yeah, stuff, um, that is, um, it's, it's reusable. So we missed the slide yeah. of the, the latest version of what has been produced in Lincolnshire. It was built around a JCB fast track tractor, but it doesn't have to be. It could be um, bolted onto, for example. No. What, what, you, what, what I see you do though, is you go in and upgrade the phone, then you go in again, change the phone number and upgrade that phone. That's all you need to do. Sorry, Mark, I've muted you accidentally. <laughs> Hello, sorry. Have I, how long have I been going? Oh, 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 only a short time. OK, so um, Susan, answering your question. Hi, sorry. So um, I, I don't, did you did you hear uh, did you hear me talk about the uh, the biomethane powered tractor? I, I, I did, yes. I mean, our, our, our particular problem, yes, our particular problem in Derbyshire is that we're finding a lot of the verges we just can't cut because of the slopes um, that we back up against walls rather than hedges. Great, um, great. Yeah. I, and I just wondered if, if there'd been any developments in the machinery available on the market. Yes, we're, we're, have, we're, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, definitely. Um, short answer, yes. Uh, it was the slide that we missed. It was the one okay. of um, uh, a, a, a red coloured, um, uh, basically, um, it's a, a Tifamec uh, sidearm flail um, mm. and it has a suction uh, facility. So. Basically, if something is at a slope and it is at a dis some distance from the road ver verge edge, if it is a you know if it's a uh, you know a kind of something that would topple a compact tractor, uh, you know, mm. um, uh, or would make it impossible to use uh, other kinds of uh, equipment, then yes, it's still, um, it still it means that the vast majority of verges would be accessible and uh, harvestable, uh, and and yes, um, happy to send you details of that. It, it exists um, and it, it's available for hire if you wanted to try it yourself. Um, well, the key... um, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. OK, so I mean, I think the, the key uh, showstopper historically has been, although the machine exists, the um, basically the, the um, waste regulations uh, don't allow currently for the, um, the collection, the storage and the utilisation of road verge herbage because it's um, seen to be a waste but it doesn't have a, um, a waste classification, so it can't be incorporated into standard permitting for, for waste handling uh, under waste licenses. Um, there is a workaround uh, uh, with uh, road verge grass for composting in Dorset, provided by um, a company called Eco uh, Sustainability Solutions. So they're worth um, contacting, but I would say that uh, uh, the incorporation of hydrochar production with uh, anaerobic digestion works around that so that the potential uh, contaminants are dealt with by bonding it all to a char, mm. which becomes asphalt. And that's that's one way of getting around that issue. Mm. And are those, is, is, is that currently accessible? Because, you know, my, my members are looking for change next year. Right. But to how, how you, I'm struggling to see how we can get arisings to these places. Great. Um, I, I suppose you, um, you need to plan uh, put plans in place to understand what would be the viable catchment radii you know uh, from it's places you can good store this from Derbyshire. <laughs> right right so mm. that is that is a um, a key constraint however mm. you um what we're what we're aiming to do uh, we're in the final round uh, of um, the, the application stage for the live labs to uh, program hopefully we'll 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 get some funding but effectively 
um, you could entertain in the first instance a um, something in a in a, in a, in a depot uh, with a very small footprint that is suitably bunded for waste management, but it could have a small modular anaerobic digestion plant alongside um, an accompanying hydrochar facility. And that would be the, the core of your operation, which could perhaps, um, we found with studies that we've undertaken with Leeds University, that 20 kilometers radius uh, can, can generally, for the sake of the haulage of the material, be a viable uh, catchment. So if you if you want any more information, uh, we can gladly forward that on to you. Um, you. It's all doable and it does require systemic change. This is the this it is the challenge. Is. It is. We've, we've got a long way here and it's it's really nice to be here and talking with, with people who are also enthusiastic about it. But yes, we're, we're, we're down to real nitty gritty stuff now. 20 kilometer radii is not scalable for us. So how are we going to make it work? That was on the basis of large containers and um, ensiling uh, with effectively large silage clamps. So that I've, I've presented the, the hybrid solution, if you like. Sure. So you've got the Dorset model of just taking some of those. Um, yeah. And that gets around the waste regs, too, because if you're keeping the, 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 um, the cuttings within the road verge system, it hasn't left that, if you like. So That's it can be fine areas. At the moment. Mm. But I mean, not wanting to talk your time much longer. That's what we're doing at the moment. But okay. it's costing us double. Double. So what you ha haven't seen uh, yet, then, what Dorset saw on its lighter soils, possibly. Um, basically, it's because yeah, we're having to do it twice. So we're having oh, to do okay. because of the machinery not being mm. able to cope and also the not being able to deal with the arisings locally. We're mm. having to send one crew out to do a verge this way and another crew out to come back to the uh, same verge to do the other bit of the verge that way. So we're doubling effort. And that's right. what we're trying to take. Anyway, sorry, yeah. uh, Mark, I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm perhaps a conversation for somewhere else because I've yes, of course. Did an excellent, be excellent presentation. Very, I'd sure be very happy like to link you to, yeah. I mean, Dors your Dorset counterparts, be very happy to link yes. you to you know, them so you can see Lovely. their journey and all the decisions yes. they've had to make along Thank the way. You. Thank Pleasure. You. Pleasure. So we've got another question um, again about finding out more about anaerobic digestion from Oliver. And yes, indeed. One from Peter about um, dealing with verge detritus and rubbish. Yes, indeed, Peter. Absolutely. So a suction flare will suck up uh, the, the the nasty stuff as well as the good, of course. And um, there are uh, there's some uh, research going on uh, soon to to look into ways in which a um, an interchangeable head might be fitted to a biomass harvester so that it can make the first pass um, to harvest the biomass, a second pass with tines to bring up the packaging, the physical contamination. Uh, and um, what we found is that there's a lot of accumulated litter, a historical litter, and there might be a process of bringing into condition over the first season uh, verges, which can then subsequently be um, uh, harvested with much less litter uh, within them. The Dorset model, um, that, that delivers um, cuttings to uh, a composting facility, which isn't the ideal environmental fate, but they have um, a complete solution in terms of um, riddling out the, you know, the offending items, cans, bottles, wrappers, uh, paper, packaging. And, and of course, an ultimate workaround is um, mapping the hotspots of where litter is. It generally tends to be, you know, the, the, the distance it, it takes to finish your fast food from the outlet it was bought from um, on a slow moving passenger side. And that can be simply where the, you turn off the suction flail and you don't contaminate your the greater part of your load or where you can focus your litter picking um, but there are ways to automate it there are ways to um, autoclave the plastics so that they sink to the bottom or float them to the top of flotation tanks um, there are ways to use eddy currents uh, and and uh, um, uh, to, to deal with the ferromagnetic metals as well uh, so yeah there are a number of process steps that could be incorporated um, and there's also arguably, you know, some value to be had by recycling some of this material. But yes, there are there are a number of approaches uh, and um, solutions have been found in the Dorset model. And uh, um, yeah, I could go on with all of all of us if you like. I could carry on to to answer all of us. Yes, um, just very quickly. Yeah, it, love to find out more about the anaerobic digestion. You'd be more than welcome. And I could say that um, you know we've we've got some. Um, We've got basically um, a library of scientific papers that we're drawing from in our own research. Um, we're 
Um, we've got field trials that uh, and reports have been written on uh, the energetics involved. Uh, the anaerobic digestion, we've been able to show that in places um, w we can actually get a better yield of biomethane uh, from road verge grass than we can from a purpose grown energy crop of maize. So it's all very favourable and it takes the pressure off food producing land. It starts to recycle fertility from um, marginal land back onto um, food producing land. Uh, it, it can, um, yeah, it, it can certainly be part of an on farm solution, but where it comes to centralized waste um, processing and disposal, um, then maybe it simply needs a conversation at the water cooler between um, officers at lo in local authorities who work within the capacity of a local highways authority with those who work within uh, the capacity of uh, the, the waste disposal authority and balancing the books across the two so that a waste disposal facility contracted out um, would have the facilities in place to derive the added value uh, the added benefits as well uh, of uh, processing a wider range of um, organic wastes uh, and the scientific literature is even saying that if you co-digest grass cuttings with food waste for example you generate uh, more biomethane more efficiently than if you were to attempt the same individually so there are lots of wins uh, involved in all of this excellent thank you mark that's been really really useful and it will be great to see um the successes of, of some of the authorities um, within the Midlands and, and maybe Alison that's for for a future event um, so that we can see how we're progressing with uh, with road verges with within Walsall we've had some difficulties um, progressing with road verges simply because um, politicians and councillors find finding it difficult to cope with what they think is a, a messy verge because they're used to having it close mode so uh, yeah we'll we'll be uh, slightly behind everyone else I think in Walsall um so our thank next you. thank you thank you Mark and next speaker is Simeon Linstead who's now with us from um start with local uh hi Simeon hello good afternoon to you all thank you for having me so, so over um, to you. Great, great. I'm going to put some slides up on the, the screen. Um, so basically I'm going to go through a handful of slides, not too many. And um, during that, I'll um, dip into our website as well, Trees for Streets, and um, show you what we've been talking about. So let me let me get the slides up. Bear with me for a second. Everything's been a little bit slow, but bear with me. Right, I don't, for some reason I can't get into the slide deck. Doesn't matter, I'll just go on with this. So let, let me start. So I'm basically here today to talk about um, trees for streets. Um, so, um, yeah. Sorry, I'm getting, everything is seized up a little bit on my machine. No, here we go, right, I've, I've got you. So. Trees for Streets uh, is, uh, we we run a uh, national street tree and park tree sponsorship scheme. Um, and uh, this this initial slide just uh, try, just um, uh, gets over a little bit of background behind the project. So um, Trees for Streets is a scheme that sits in a charity called Trees for Cities. Um, I actually run a company called Start With Local, but we we basically are a, a partner that provides the service into Trees for Cities. But for all intents and purposes, um, this is a Trees for St uh, Cities uh, project. Trees for Cities is a, a national tree charity that focuses on the urban space um, and they do a range of different projects from um, uh, from woodland uh, wood, woodland creation to schools uh, planting uh, planting on housing estates to helping local authorities raise money for tree planting um, and tree streets is the scheme that focuses on street trees uh, it says what it does on the tin it's very run seal um, within the Trees for Streets project, we run the National tree, Street Tree Sponsorship Scheme. We also run a, a scheme called Celebration Trees, which is about letting people do something similar, but sponsor trees in parks. 
and we also do uh, have a crowdfunding platform so we can um, let communities um, crowdfund towards um, planting schemes uh, in, in in streets or in their streets or in their local parks um, and the whole uh, scheme has been funded by uh, DEFRA for its Green Recovery Challenge Fund um, in London. Uh, we're part of the um, delivery uh, mechanism for the London um, Forest Plan. So we've got some uh, good backing. In fact, the Mayor of London has just put quite a bit of money through the scheme for us to help uh, local councils um, plant uh, street trees and get them involved um, in the scheme. Um, we've been we were launched in May 2021 and um, um, we <clears throat> work now work with 15 local authorities, including Coventry, which is obviously near your neck of the woods. But uh, uh, over the last 18 months, we we've now gained a very good base of experience working with a quite a diverse range of um, different uh, councils. Um, and most of those councils, we run both schemes of street trees and park tree sponsorship. And we've been um, just trialing our crowdfunding um, in, in a couple of the locations as well. And what's been amazing about this is we're working with um, the different councils where we've we've learned a lot, but also we're finding one of the valuable things we do on top of running a, a sponsorship scheme is um, le connecting councils up because we find that um, there's lots of information that is different from one place to another, costs that are different in one place to another, procedures, um, and councils are finding that quite a useful um, process as well. So um, uh, why do we do the scheme? Well, one of the big reasons we do uh, tree streets um, is we want to get more trees into the UK streets. And um, I think people on the whole get um, tree planting, um, but uh, I, I think they kind of get that in a woodland setting. So I think that we, we still find there's a case to make for why on earth you should pack a street full of trees. Um, and often when we present the scheme, this is one of the slides we use particularly with politicians. These are two streets, very similar um, built um, space, but the, the space between the buildings is very different. Uh, and um, we uh, saw this particularly so when we had that heat wave um, earlier on this year, um, that you know, if you were living in the, the bottom street, that would be like an oven and if you're living in the top street it would be rather lovely space to be and, and much more resilient to um, the extremes we're now seeing with our weather whether it's uh, very high high levels of heat um, or a, extreme uh, sort of rain um, and in terms of also our own physical and mental well-being um, the the top street is one that you'd much rather your kids cycled on than the bottom street it's a street that you'd much rather walk down than the bottom street so it encourages sort of physical activity and there's plenty of uh, studies that have gone on to show that um, tree-lined streets neighborhoods um, people generally are mentally uh, physically um, healthier so um, we we try to keep making that case and bang that home particularly with the politicians so they don't see it as a nice to have but they see it as a, an absolutely uh, essential uh, to have uh, element of the uh, the built built space um, the other um, big feature of the uh, project is all about engaging or connecting communities with trees, with the environment and with their immediate neighbourhood. Um, and it's absolutely uh, essential because I think nowadays um, in our local spaces, I think people feel incredibly frustrated in terms of actually making anything happen, have feeling any sense of empowerment. So our scheme creates a simple mechanism pathway to doing something as powerful as getting a tree planted outside your house somewhere in your street um, and by giving people small victories it opens the door it changes the narrative changes the conversation and um, encourages people to do more and uh, basically is, is is all part of helping um, communities become more uh, resilient so um, picture uh, the, 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 the image we've got on screen at the moment is of um, uh, our scheme we run a scheme in Haringey it's our it's a scheme that we've got that's going absolutely fantastically but they've been going with us uh, for 18 months since we uh, begun and we've um, so far in that time we've had over 420 requests to sponsor uh, trees so we're, we're quite a, making quite a significant impact on their um, tree planting in that ward but we've got the images there you've got a street with some people holding our leaflets and um, they um, 
uh, ended up sponsoring six trees to go on that road. They collectively collected the money and now they look after them. And we have lots of streets in Haringey that come together um, to um, green their streets and, and look after their trees. And the, the, the picture there is we've got you know, there's a synagogue with a tree outside. We have the councillors there who crowdfunded for trees. We're a local estate agent, quite a few other businesses that are funding trees. There's a wealthy donor who's also funded trees on across the, the east of the borough, which is the less affluent side. So the tree, three trees in the top all right, are on the Broadwater Farm Estate. So it's a fantastic um, sort of story you get when the schemes work well and they work well when we get good um, you know there's good buying for the community when we get the council um, um, working with us as well and that because they have got their own communication channels and they can promote the schemes that makes a big difference um, and that all pulls together to create a really wonderful um, piece of engagement um, and if we go down the next slide um, we also do, um, when we were creating the scheme, we were working with tree officers and uh, one of the, uh, the tree officers said, well, look, if I'm going to put my street trees with you, I'd like to put my dedication park trees. So we, we've also built a journey for sponsoring large trees in parks. Um, and the, the, and we've called it celebration trees because traditionally, much like in this picture, uh, here's a, um, a family that have come together to um, mark uh, the, the a loved one who with with a tree but we we now by calling it celebration trees um have um, people doing it for uh christenings uh, we just got there's a couple that contacted us this weekend who have set up a little crowd funder so everyone rather than giving the wedding presents are funding some trees in in cambridge in their parks so you can sort of see where that can go to um now with um a sponsorship um we haven't reinvented the wheel by running a sponsorship scheme um, and councils have been doing it for a number of years, but it's never created that much uh, in, in the way of um, a sort of volume of activity. And we, we looked at this and we, we saw that councils tend to raise money for trees or street trees from either their own direct funding, um, construction levies like Sill and 106, um, grants. Um, and and those are the, the main channels. So we thought, well, let's see if we can do more with um, sponsorship and everything that's associated with it. Um, and the things that were kind of been we identified that holding it back were um, of having a really good web experience. So um, we've we've um, we'll show you the website in a moment, um, and also just doing lots of uh, marketing and engagement work in the areas where we are based. Um, so the picture here is some of the engagement work that we do. Um, and we've got a local engagement manager and marketing uh, manager who work on the project. Um, but we've identified there are three routes to getting the scheme out into the, um, uh, the, 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 the local community. So one is that the council itself, um, we work with councils and we, um, we provide councils with um, com content, case studies, et cetera, to put out in their own comms channels. And they're very powerful um, indeed as, as, as a method of uh, promotion. Uh, we also go out and tap up community groups and then we do direct marketing as well. Um, and that would include like sort of paid for social media, uh, leaflet drops, um, organic social media. And then when the trees get planted, we put our kind of bright green labels on them. And uh, when you've got quite a number of trees in an area, um, those labels really act as quite a strong way of um, promoting um, the scheme but it's those sort of three kind of channels together the council channels the commute direct to the community direct to the um, uh, 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 the the residents that they all kind of tie in together and support and um, helps us uh, make the schemes work really well so that's uh, how we get the scheme communicated um, and the um, um, website that we've created. I'll come out of this slide and I'll hop onto the website and I'll just demo the website for you. And um, that's really what I'm going to show you today. So let, let me do that. So let me finish this um, and then we'll go into the website. So there we go. So we built uh, this site um, to as uh, we, we were finding actually a lot of councils where the, they were promoting sponsorship schemes there was kind of you go onto a website you go deeper and deeper into the council website and you end up in some sort of pdf that form they have to print off and fill in to rec uh, sponsor a tree so we wanted to make it really easy and we've, we've done it here um so if you were say in that Harringay example i showed you um we'd search on the borough um and 
you then have a page with um, the schemes that are running, so street trees, uh, park trees, and um, we've actually got a, a crowdfunder that's just finished um, there. So if you were uh, looking to sponsor a tree in a street, you go to the landing page, it sort of describes how much it is to sponsor a tree in a street, um, the, how much the council want you to donate, timings, etc. And then you go uh, and find the location you want. So if um, I met a fantastic couple who were living just south of Ali Valley on Southview Road, and I'll just show you what they would have done. So they they could have just put the postcode in, but I can actually pan in on the map. So they would have said, yeah, I live there. We pull up the address, so confirm that. And then we ask them some questions about uh, that location. So is there a tree pit there? There was not. Uh, what's the verge like? It was a hard surface um, and then sort of pavement width and obstructions. There was the pavement width was over two meters and there were no no sort of obstructions um, preventing the tree from being planted. So we asked those and then we asked them to submit a couple of photos. Um, and then finally, we just take a couple of bits of information on if there's any thoughts about the tree. Um, so quite a lot of people say, can I have something that's got blossom? and whether they're prepared to water the tree and the watering is actually really important because um, a lot of people probably don't realize just um, you know councils can spend uh, quite a lot of money watering a tree Typ typically we see somewhere between three and seven pounds per water and if you think you're watering it all the way through the summer and you may be doing that for two or now there's quite a few councils are saying they're doing it for three years because of this extra hot summer we've just had. It's a fortune. So if the residents who are sponsored trees can pick up on that, it's a big, it's a big saving. Or if councils aren't using it as a way to save money, it um, certainly um, raises the success rate of that establishment of that tree. So if you say yes, I'll water, and at that point you're you're basically through. We say this is what you've done. Fill in your details. These are my details, um, and confirm. And then we. We simply take the payment details. We do not take a donation at this point to the charity. We um, we we do that once the council's approved that the tree can go ahead, and it, once it has, we we collect all that money in and we pass the monies over to the council at the end of the the season. So that's where we're at with our street tree planting, and that works really well. We got a really high conversion rate on that, and then we um, we do part tree planting where um, you basically pick a part that you want a tree in. Um, so you can, if you wanted to pick a, a tree to sponsor in Chestnuts Park, you click on that and fill in details and you pay your donation and the tree gets planted that coming season. And uh, we then go back to them and let the sponsor know where the tree is. And it is as simple as that. We, we've got a couple of schemes, uh, Bristol and Ealing, where the councils have actually given us the uh, trees, the actual locations of the trees. So they say we would like to plant an oak in the corner of here if we can get a sponsor for it. So that's quite nice um, as well. And all this sort of sponsorship work also creates sort of community led fundraising interest. Um, so this was a scheme in um, um, Haringey in Tottenham where <clears throat> some residents came together to fund 17 trees in the, these streets here. Uh, they raised four and a half thousand um, pounds and this came about actually because somebody wanted to sponsor a tree outside their house um, they couldn't because of there were utilities there and then the neighbor opposite them didn't want it outside their house so we said well look don't worry about that location but why don't you join together with your neighbors to green the whole street so that's exactly what they did there was some money came in from the council um, and they did a local crowdfund scheme and four and a half thousand pounds later uh, within the next three months, they'll have a tree, uh, a street that's tree lined and they set up this scheme. It's really nice. They even did some mock ups of what it would look like after the trees had gone in. And that will transform that street. And, and the other point to make is the yeah, sure, the council could have, um, you know, at some point in the future, the trees might have been planted there. But if you think of the impact that's had on that community because they've proactively changed where they live, it's actually immeasurable. Um, so um, this has been this is we, we, we love um, when, when um, re communities come together and do that and take control and feel um, empowered. So um, that is the scheme. We also appeal to um, businesses um, uh, and we, we tend to find when we're working in areas we, we take on new councils all the time that, that it starts quite small then it gradually builds up um, and the scheme sort of builds up a nice um, momentum 
all of its own. Um, so that, I was told to keep this quite short, is Trees for Streets, and I'm very happy to answer any questions. Or I, th I think we're doing that after uh, Tim has uh, spoken, um, but I'm uh, happy either way. That's that's right, Simeon. Uh, we were going to do questions and answers um, after Tim's told us a little bit about what's happening in Coventry. Tim, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hopefully you can see me now, can you? Yeah. Good, OK. Um, well, Simeon's given a really good explanation of uh, how the scheme works from trees for streets point of view. And for me as the recipient of that as a council, uh, it was brilliant. They've been an absolutely fantastic team in creating the web pages which are specific for us as a council, doing all the work to put the comms out there, create the comms, connect with our comms team when our comms team can be interested actually, but that's another story. Um, and then all we do is sit and wait and the applications have been coming in all the way through the year and it's been remarkable. Um, we're now approaching 20 applications and I thought that we may get a dozen if we were lucky and it's amazing actually in a time where people don't seem to have an awful lot of money that there's quite a few that actually are willing to put their hand in the pocket and, and sponsor a tree near their property. So on screen what I've got is this is just one example of a celebration tree which was planted in Belgrave Square. That's gone in quite recently. Um, here's another if it'll change over, there we go, to one which we've got in Parkville Highway in Coventry. This is actually one of two. There's one just to the left off out of the picture, which I foolishly didn't take a picture of, but this chap in his house um, wanted to invest some of his um, business funding into planting trees on his highway. And it is going to expand into more uh, after I was having a chat with him. And um, hopefully that will then produce um, more trees on Parkville Highway. Right, so there's a webinar in the background. OK, um, so yeah, it has gone tremendously well uh, and, and better than I anticipated it would do. And uh, we've closed our scheme now for applications for this year because basically we've run out of trees, um, not through this scheme, but we've run out of trees per se. There's just been lots of take up with the memorial trees and other projects that we wanted to fulfill. But what I'd in my head allocated for this, we've by far exceeded it uh, and we've done really well. Um, given that I reserved my trees back in March, I have to kind of commit to an, a guesstimate of what we were heading for. Um, and yes, it's done. It's done very, very well. So uh, it's a great project. Now I think uh, all councils should try and tie into it. Um, one of the biggest benefits is I get a feel day to day for what the public thinks of us as a service, but also of the council. And most people have a dim view of council services, and it took away the face of the council from this scheme. I think it's given people a lot of confidence that what they're buying into sort of isn't the council. It's it's something else. Um, but in the background, we of course are the ones which will do all the mechanics of getting the trees, getting it in the ground, adopt them and then underwrite that tree for the future. But we haven't had to really invest in the whole cost of getting that tree in the ground. And it's a win-win. As Simeon was saying, the buying from the public to um, water the tree, they will, they will feel value in that it's their tree. And when it starts to mature over the coming years, they'll take pride in it. And it's proper community buying. And, um, some of the people that I've spoken to who have uh, sponsored trees, they are very, very pleased with it and you know they're, they're, they're beaming with a smile. So yeah, it's not a negative at all. It's fantastic. So in, that's, in a summary, really, it's great. Thanks, Tim. That was really useful. And uh, thank you, Simeon. I think we've got one question in the chat which is from Julia and it's about issues with vandalism, which certainly was a concern of mine too. We do in urban areas get quite a lot of uh, damage to um, council planted trees. Um, so uh, how how are authorities dealing with that issue particularly? Well, I, I can talk broadly and then also Tim can speak very specifically about country, but bro broadly across the scheme, I think the schemes, um, because we, we're kind of self-selecting in the sense that um, 
the, those people who choose to sponsor a tree of, of, of want it and they tend to that's their mindset and and probably that's representative more so of the the road they they live in so there um we haven't um, you know uh, over this i mean by the end of this season we'll have had about i think we'll, we'll have funded about two and a half thousand trees um uh, from one way or another um and we um we we have there aren't many instances um well that i know of um uh, that i've been told of and I, I should hear about a lot of these um where a sponsor tree is is damaged we had i'm i, I can literally just remember some off the top of my head because they they stand out so much but i remember in croydon we had a a street that sponsored four trees on some grass verges that vans parked on previously and uh someone in one of the houses was worried that that would affect um, people maybe parking outside his drive or something and he pulled the tree out but his neighbors put it back in again and told him not to do it and that was the 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 end of that um i haven't heard of any other trees that have been sponsored that um have been damaged um or sorry vandalized um we we do know uh, but the different we we had some trees because we for instance passed um some grant money over to tim last year so about 34 trees were planted in coventry through grant money um and we had um, an instance in croydon where in the north of the borough in thornton heath um i went to photograph some of the grant trees in one road and a few and about three were snapped off um and that was rare because we we went around and we checked every tree that had been planted um we we sort of surveyed them so i think we we don't have i mean it's the really weird thing we don't have a lot of the problems that i hear when i go and do meetings with the council so i i, I hear other stories about lots of other problems but through the scheme and, and particularly the way that the tree officers manage it and the way it relates to the public seems to work i mean it gets rid of all sorts of other problems as well like um some councils tell me they have all sorts of problems with failed locations to plant in but uh, i we have uh, uh once they've been surveyed uh we we have almost like a handful across the scheme that ever fail so um that's you know, all like i can say that's our experience so far um tim i don't know how about you yeah from a, a a council point of view we of course do get van trees being vandalized but i think this scheme attracts the investment from the parts of the city particularly in coventry where a lot of that doesn't happen uh, it's, it's the affluent areas uh, the other side of the city we don't tend to get too many applications and that was where we would see vandalism to trees but it's not an excessive amount we we may have to deal with four or five trees out of the whole stock that we've planted across the winter and we plant 350 plus this year and so you know, it's 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 not a huge thing it's in relation to this scheme though the person's invested in this tree we're basically then going to adopt and underwrite it so if it does get vandalized it's up to us to then put that right and so the person's investment is back how it was and, how, and what they want and and that's exactly what we're buying into by this that is ultimately still cheaper than if we were uh, buying all the trees and putting them in ourselves which we can't do so it, it, it's win-win all round. Yeah, it's actually worth mentioning also, Tim, because you talked about where the sponsorships come around. So in Coventry, it's quite interesting. We're seeing uh, a lot of sponsorships come from that sort of um, the sort of between. If you're looking at like at a clock face, it's between I suppose five o'clock and um, nine o'clock. Uh, so that's that sort of bottoms uh, of each road, it's a southwest corner, um, and um, that's um, we. I, I suppose in quite a few other places we do see a broader spread but what we're also trying to do and we we have done is bring grant money in um so in year one um tim planted trees in areas that were categorized as high priority areas low canopy high deprivation um and we're also making inroads in terms of the corporate sponsors it seems to be the sort of smaller small to medium sized enterprises but we when we're getting quite a volume of those now um and the planting that we want them to go to support are the priority areas which at the moment for us are high deprivation low canopy uh, streets with state schools on them and um shade planting for playgrounds are the ones that we're focusing on right now um so we um the last two years we've been running the scheme the scheme has pulled in um you know quite reasonable amounts of grant money this year we just had three hundred thousand pounds from Sadiq Khan in London to give it to the London boroughs to do um this um and we're having sort of discussions with DEFRA at the moment about the the funding for the scheme uh, more long term and also what the scheme does in terms of uh helping um push the 
the message of street trees in a very proactive way. We we kind of get in people's faces with this. It's not some sort of, um, uh, I suppose, academic type of organisation. You have to go and join and go to various seminars and stuff. This is we we get in there and we we kind of connect people up, and it, it's very powerful. Um, what what's happening, and we see we're we're helping either some councils with their procedures. We're sharing procedures, we're sharing practices, and we're sharing information about prices. And that's very simple, but really powerful. I would agree with that, Simon, but the, the grant aid funding that we've received from yourselves, and we've got other sources of funding as well. That's where the balance of this distribution of tree planting will be across the city. Uh, the, where the, the northeast, where we aren't getting applications, we are planting trees, but it's it's coming from the grant funding, as you said. Great, thanks ever so much, Tim. That's really useful. So if anybody wants to get in touch with um, Simeon and um, Tim to find out more, please do. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for your presentation. Okay, okay pleasure. I'll put my email into the into the chat. Yeah, brilliant. So our next guest is Darren Rudge. Darren, are you there? I am, Liz. I'm here. Lovely, thank you. And um, the same way. <laughs> have we got some slides from you? Are you going to share your slides? Is that the plan? Uh, I thought Alison was doing that. Yeah, Hi, Alison, yes. are you there? I'm there and uh, let's hope the broadband doesn't fail this time. I've got slides ready. OK, that's great. If it does, I can share the, the slideshow. Just take me a little while uh, to bring it up. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, so uh, thank you for inviting me, folks. Um, my name is uh, Darren Rudge. Um, I uh, operated in a number of guises actually before we start. Um, I do run a community interest company called Rudgewood Horticulture with a, a colleague of mine called Helen Wood. Um, that's where the business name comes from, uh, Rudgewood. Um, and um, also, I teach, I'm a lecturer. Um, and I'm a garden designer and I design uh, public and private spaces. So um, I'm going to really um, come from come, come at this from a slightly different angle um, and we'll be selling roughly the same message as Mark um, because I'm going to look at verges and traffic islands and really um, my interest in ecology, uh, the environment comes from um, around about the 90s, mid 90s um, uh, and uh, and basically just realising that the, the problems that we're encountering now um, have, have been around for a long, long time. So if you'd like to change the onto the next slide, please, Alison, um, and just click again because I've put some animations into this. Um, uh, each moment done it, we, we have to mention that, you know, in the in the last quarter of the 20th century, um, this realisation that we're losing nature and natural habitat um, suddenly hit us and that we need to get vegetation into our towns and cities and the way to actually do that. Um, and Hitchmo and Dunnett uh, um, from Sheffield um, uh, carried out a lot of research uh, and put in a lot of schemes into urban space and public space just to see what the reaction would be to, to um, uh, these plantings and, and found, you know, a, a lot of things that uh, uh, we still encounter today. And Liz mentioned that, you know, in Warsaw, and I live in Warsaw, is where I'm broadcasting from. Uh, we do have an issue with uh, naturalistic plantings. Um, the fact that people think they look messy or want to go in and weed. Um, uh, and they are still big issues at the end of the day. Uh, but by the um, uh, the end of the 20th century, then we'd got designers like Uldorf, uh, Noel Kingsbury, um, Tom Stewart Smith, those sort of people that were really putting a strong aesthetic element into the ecological planting, not only for wildlife, but for ourselves, for humans, uh, for well-being. And a lot of deprived areas uh, were shown uh, to have uh, uh, a massive impact on on behaviours if they were given some green space, if they were given something pretty to look at, um, and the fact that crime went down, um, and and they just enjoyed the space more with some green space. Flick the next slide up for me, Alison, please. 
and again click again. Um, once again, um, where Mark comes from as, as Plant Life 2013, this document had a major impact on me um, uh, within urban planting style and public space. And uh, um, at this particular point in, in time, um, I was designing park schemes as well as road schemes, as well as small road traffic islands and, and putting into place and trying to get pe people really, really interested in, in seeing that verges and road traffic islands are a place where ecology can have a home. And this document really sort of supported the things that I was trying to push at that particular point in time where, you know, if you're a landscape operator and manager, you know, you have verges, you have traffic islands that you can actually uh, use and utilise for um, for ecology, for wildlife and for the betterment of, of communities and to bring communities together and have, have something that's local um, to actually be proud of. Let's drop the next slide on, please, Alison. So the importance of our road verges, there you go. And this is unashamedly taken from that document. You know, 97% of our meadows are destroyed or have been destroyed since the 1930s. And they're a vital refuge for pollinators and other wildlife. But they give us more than that. We've got noise reduction and buffers, our pollination corridors. You know, they enhance our biodiversity. The soil is four times um, more able than the atmosphere to store carbon. I mean, if we put plants in there, as Mark said earlier, we actually store more carbon, um, which cannot escape into the atmosphere. How about enhancing that local character? Um, why not have, um, and I'm gonna show some pictures in a moment, the local character that you, you can actually have and have people actually saying, have you seen that traffic island in, in such and such a place? Improved air quality and definitely, uh, you know, uh, tourism gateway. Let's pop up the next slide, slide, Alison. So proper ecological management of our verges and traffic islands would create a pollinator habitat the size of London, Birmingham, Manchester, Cardiff and Edinburgh combined and more cities to come. So we really do need this, folks, because we've, we've lost so much wildlife habitat at the end of the day and why wouldn't you want a hay meadow at the next and at the side of, of uh, your your main roads to look at um, in your journey into work you know your commute it's absolutely stunning and can be created um, quite simply um, and can be maintained quite simply as well next slide then Alison so we need to to manage our roadside plantings as, as, an, as a nationally significant response to the, this decline in our wildlife. You know, if we raise the management bar across the whole UK estate, um, we can do this, not just on a few hundred miles of roadside nature reserves at the end of the day. If we put these management processes into place, it's better for us, it's better for the wildlife, and, you know, it will be better ultimately for the country and for climate change. Next slide, please, Alice. So it gives us a differing management approach at the end of the day. Mark, no doubt, I didn't catch um, the first part of his talk, so I apologise for that. But, you know, a reduction in cutting frequency at the end of the day can be achieved. Um, reducing vegetation growth and the result resulting management burden. You can cut and just leave. Um, you don't have to rake off and take away. Improves the natural capital value, in particular the number and diversity of flowering plants, and ordinarily results in, in sustainable operational costs uh, in the longer term and re a reduced carbon footprint. And why wouldn't you want all those things at the end of the day? Next uh, slide, please, Alison. So it does support the government and statutory agencies to deliver their statutory duties and gives you that biodiversity net gain uh, that we all want and are, ob are obligated to achieve. It's an industry's corporate social responsibility to reduce um, environmental impact and the road network um, can fully contribute towards you know environmental, social and economical objectives. Put these into place especially in urban environments the community will come together. Um, they will respect more, more the space themselves, but we've just got to get, get that uh, community buy-in. Next slide, slide, please, Alice. 
if you create a species rich grassland it's a brilliant way to improve the biodiversity value of, of road planting we've got all this space to use and utilize and yet um, we don't seem to be able to do it and just push that little bit further and put these things into in, into place uh, for the benefit of us and for plants and there's a quote from plant life that document 2030 i suggest you know if you're seriously interested in taking on these approaches that you do get a copy of that um and uh, uh, there's, there's a website link on the slide with um uh, that particular document for you to click into and just read through it's quite startling and stunning uh, the information that's actually involved there and shows you how just simply you can actually manage these spaces and um, be improving spaces um, in a richer way not only for wildlife but also for the community around them next slide please Alison so quite simply we can put this planting model and I've used this quite successfully on a number of occasions. Zone A is really very little um, uh, worth for environment. It just keeps things looking neat and tidy at the end of the day. Zone B is a short meadow with a sward. Uh, zone C, then you get taller herbs and gives you um, areas where uh, things like butterflies can overwinter. And then you can have hedgerows and trees and things like that towards the back so you know on on uh, roadside verges and on traffic islands we have to be mindful that uh, people don't want to have things obstructing their view so tend to tailor things away um, towards the middle or towards hedgerows um, uh, moving along but uh, can achieve some stunning effects so i think the next, next slide shows just some examples of sort of seed mixes that we uh, we may actually want to use uh, I'll correct myself because maintaining it, you know, but we can go back to uh, to that one if you like, Alison. Uh, just maintenance because it's a it's a two two maintenance uh, two cut maintenance approach if you can. But if you can only cut once a year, then that's fine at the end of the day. Um, but make sure if you've got a species rich ward that you actually cut um, at the end of the season, so mid July, uh, September and October. Seed mixes here. There's a couple. Click again, Alison. So um, you've got um, lowland meadow mixes, species, um, upland hay meadow species. And if you know how these seed mixtures um, um, actually work, you've got um, things that will actually, um, you know, police other plants. And if you uh, cut at the right times of year, then you're actually um, controlling those coarser grass species that may actually try and take over. Next slide, slide please, Alison. Um, Travelling through um, urban areas, and we've just had Tim on from Coventry. I'm absolutely stunned by what Coventry have done with their road verges, and indeed some of the traffic islands, especially out towards the University of Warwick. And I do strongly suggest that if you've not been here, folks, then just go and have a look. It's absolutely stunning, and this is this is this aesthetic um, that towards the end of the 20th century. People People have put into their road verge schemes and it looks stunning folks it looks absolutely gorgeous and the amount of diversity um, that's actually in these road verges is, is is uncalculable really at the end of the day but you know just gives you that wonderful wonderful feeling that uh, when you drive past these things it just looks absolutely fabulous next slide so greener schemes here's a scheme in devon which is quite green um, you know, but gives you that traditional view rather than a hay meadow view. You can still have, um, you know, trees and shrubs. And the next few slides that I've popped in just give you, you know, some examples that I've actually used and utilised. And then the slide on the right is a is a an inner city London um, scheme um, that gives you over canopy scrub and shrubs uh, that's being proposed at the moment uh, around uh, a central traffic island uh, for. Uh, For, uh, for uh, the people living around and about. Click again, Alison. So highways for wildlife, wildlife trusts, those sorts of things. Here we go, sustainable trees. And again, Alison, give it another click. You know, you can have oaks, quercus, ilex, um, um, holly, crataegus, hawthorn. I think everybody will know that contains 
you know, can contain up to uh, uh, 1500 invertebrate species, betula, birch, prunus, salix, willow, amelanchia. You can have all these flowering trees if you want them, you know, at the end of the day um, in your traffic islands, they just need to be managed um, and obviously planted um, with the philosophy, uh, the, the right plant, right place. We'll move on, Alison. Sustain sustainable shrubs, give it another click, Alison. And again, cornus, you know, um, Cornus mass, Cornus um, uh, sanguinea, um, Cornus alba, all those sorts of things. Prunus spinosa, wonderful bird ha habitat. Ilex is a shrub. Hippophia rhamnoides is a gorgeous plant to have for habitat, um, both for berries, thorns, grey foliage, berberis, corallus, hazel, sustainable perennials, just a, a short list there. Acanthus mollis, Acanthus Spinosus, geranium, cranes, bills, cocosmia, anemones, asters, astilbes. You can still be creating these wonderful, wonderful mixes, um, but with an ecolog uh, ecological hat on. Next slide, then, please, Alison. And here we go again. Here's some grasses, folks. Stiper, Stiper gigantea, um, Stiper tenuissima, Calamagrostis, um, Descamsia. Uh, you know, a native grass, some miscanthus. Uh, climbers, yeah, you can pop them in. Clematis, Linusa, Hedra, uh, Jasminum, um, summer flowering jasmine, even winter flowering jasmine, and Akebia, the chocolate vine. All wonderful plants that you can mix, utilise and use in a naturalistic way to give you that aesthetic, but also um, to give you a place that um, uh, wildlife can make a happy home. Next slide then, please, Alison. Um, we took this because I, I teach, uh, we, we took this in 27 to BBC Gardeners World Live and uh, Helen and myself, Helen Wood and myself designed uh, a show garden that we built with, with students uh, to show what possibly could be done uh, um, on a road traffic island planting. Um, we just put a naturalistic approach in there and uh, won a silver, silver medal for our, um, our uh, sort of pains and strains at the end of the day but you know we got quite a lot of reaction from this and um, uh, certainly people from local authorities were in touch and local communities um, came to speak to us about how, well how could we incorporate something like this in our local um, verges traffic islands and traffic schemes um, um, move on then Alison and community buying is a massive thing, isn't it? And I often think that, you know, producing these types of schemes really do um, need the community to, to buy into it because quite often people think it's messy or actually, um, you know, um, don't see the value. And um, Helen Wood and myself put together the, the idea of sowing the streets, you know, which is actually giving people uh, the empowerment to go out there and change things for the better for themselves. And creating this living artwork, we were at in Wolverhampton and showed people during lockdown, actually, uh, how um, how to actually produce schemes that can be of more value to them um, and impact on their community. And we pulled in some um, grant funding um, and uh, got the support of the Black Country Consortium and other bodies and just went out there and just basically um, sold the message that if we provide you with the know-how, the training uh, and, and the seeds, what can you do in your environment? Next slide please, Alison. And, and here we have a couple of photos uh, um, and um, these are in deprived areas in Wolverhampton and, and uh, the one on the left hand side is literally in front of a block of flats and it was it was weed torn, it was used as a litter trap um, we went out to that community, we, we talked to them about sowing seeds and remember wildflower seeds need nothing more than deprived soil which is what they want and that's the effect that they come up with next to their roadside and then you know for some communities they just wanted to sow seeds into cracks in the pavement and things like this and there's a poppy and some Allison that we gave them um, at the end of the day just sown into cracks in the pavement. Next slide please Alison.
And then in Tipton, the guys in Tipton just went out there and they sowed their road traffic island and there it is on the left hand side. And then in a deprived community in Low Hill in Wolverhampton, again, just a piece of wasteland that was dumping ground for fridges, old settees, things like that. The community cleaned it up. Um, we went in and they actually um, uh, themselves sowed this sward. Um, and that, um, I believe today, has been um, still being well maintained. Um, and, you know, community buying is essential for, for these schemes um, and to just have them valued at the end of the day. Um, last slide then Alison and that is me at the end of the day if I can help in any way then um, please contact me on darren at ridgewood.co.uk but there's a lot more to share and I was told to, to perhaps keep this a little bit shorter uh, but there's 20 slides for you folks and I do believe that the the, uh, the time is right um, now to be installing these schemes in 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 a large large way for the benefit of ecology, wildlife, and for the benefit of ourselves. Thank you very much for listening. I hope that hasn't bored you too much. Thanks, Darren. That was lovely. Um, there is a bit in the chat about, um, you know, planting annual species, and, and Mark's come back with some comments about, you know, trying to um, put annual displays in as crowd pleasers, but but try to stick with the native perennial mixes if, if possible. Um, but certainly in urban areas, we do need the crowd pleasers to, to set yeah. the standards first, don't we? And, and then put in the um, put the uh, the native species in later. Certainly it, it helps with trying to encourage people to take it on board. So uh, yeah, it's all useful stuff. Um, I'm conscious of time now and uh, Lorraine was due to talk to us at 3.20 and, and it's now uh, 3.37. So um, Lorraine, if you um, are happy to do your bit on auth an authorised encampments, it's something that our members were particularly interested in and um, Walsall seem to have got a good approach. So uh, yeah, if you wouldn't mind going through the, the journey that we went through. Yeah, no problem. Um, I haven't got slides, so um, it's it's just um, really some notes, uh, narrative about about the as um, Liz says the journey that we've been through in dealing with unauthorised encampments over the last few years. <clears throat> this is how we did it. It's not saying it's the right way. It's there is it's not the only way. It's just a way. Um, but I think there was some important values in our approach that um, are worth sharing as well. So Walsall has always had a large residential population from the Gypsy, Roma and Traveller communities just for the sake of ease. I'm going to use the term traveller, but that doesn't mean to say I'm, I'm, I'm referring to people who are ethnically identified as travellers. I'm just going to use it. Um, to refer to anybody who follows a travelling lifestyle. Th those people who were residential and coming from a travelling background would have visitors coming for life events, weddings, funerals, christenings, first communions, whatever. And our staff um, knew a lot of the travellers, a lot of the visitors, they had a good professional relationships and got on really well. We would start the eviction process as soon as they arrived, but we knew we it was very rare we had to see it through because we knew that the visitors were here for a defined period for an event, but we started the process just in case, just on the off chance that we weren't left at the, you know, two weeks later suddenly having to start from scratch because um, depending on which route you follow to deal with an eviction, then there is a time frame and um, a legal process you have to follow. However, in 2015-ish, we started to see a change, a change in the number of unauthorised encampments, a change in the size of them and a change in increase. Both of those were increasing along with the amount of antisocial behaviour that was associated with those unauthorised encampments. So we were looking at different approaches and at that time 
we were made aware of one authority, which was Blackpool, that had taken out injunctions. Previously, we thought you couldn't do that. So we explored this option in more detail and decided to go down that route. What was really important was that the injunction applications were evidence based, evidence based on the impacts on communities, businesses, residents. Um, <clears throat> and it was based on just the land um, and communities that had been impacted. We were very clear that we couldn't put a borough wide ban on despite pressure from some elected members and some members of the public. It, we were very clear we never attempted to do that at any point. So at the same time, we began to look at um, what many people refer to as target hardening in conjunction with our clean and green teams. So we would look at the land where we'd had unauthorised encampments and look at whether or not um, increased fencing or um, soil bunds were appropriate. Um, bunds were mostly used primarily because they were cheap and, and fairly and green in that um, a soil bund was um, created and then it was allowed to seed um, to grass over. So, so that's the approach. And I think the first injunction we took out, we had 12, just 12 sites covered by it. But like I say, it was evidence based that they, they'd all have significant impact on residents. Over the next couple of years, as those sites were protected, then travellers would find alternative sites. So displacement is a problem with any action that you take to reduce and prevent unauthorised encampments. Over the next couple of years, therefore, we took out further injunctions which added to that initial one. Um, wherever possible, we included named individuals but if as um, any, I don't know how many of you do enforcement, but your enforcement teams will, will tell you that very often we just don't have the identities of people. Vehicle registration numbers are, are swapped about um, and all sorts of tactics on vehicles are not registered. So it's very difficult. So we did have persons unknown included in the injunctions. And that had a significant, um, it did have an impact, not as significant as we wanted it to have, but what it did mean was where we'd had um, a number of unauthorised encampments and, and residents had really had some struggles, then our legal services allowed us to use common law and to evict travellers from there. Um, within tw basically within 24 hours with the using bailiffs, whereas on the sites that didn't have injunctions, the actual um, process that we followed was in the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act, Section 77 process often referred to, which we find typically takes about five working days. That's not a target, that just is from experience how long it would take because we can in extreme circumstances speed that up. However, what we find is if we speed up the eviction process, if a particular family group are determined to stay in the area, they will just set, move to another piece of land and set up a new camp and you start in again. So although speeding up the process takes pressure off a particular community, it does cause more work for the enforcement teams, ultimately more potential, different cleaning up challenges for um, your waste disposal teams and your repair challenges for your, your clean and green teams. At the same time as we were following this approach, we were still thinking about different approaches and other things that could work and could help. And then we started work on um, building a transit site. Now, the transit site in our book is a place where people can stay for a short period as they're traveling through the area. It was a long process from us first thinking about it to actually opening the transit site earlier this year. The first thing we needed was a change in mindset amongst elected members and residents and um, which 
we, we could see coming through. The residents would, you know, when we put anything out on social media about the progress of dealing with an unauthorised encampment or there was anything in the newspapers, then we were getting comments about needing a transit site. Obviously, one of the challenges is they want this people acknowledge that you want one, but they don't want one near where they live. And I'm sure we all know that that uh, mindset of people. One of the um, actions that we took our portfolio holder suggested, and it was really beneficial, was to take a report to scrutiny, and that way they were in, they were supportive of a, of the approach of building a transit site and supporting um, travellers. And that meant we had cross party support. So if we had a change of control of council following an election, we were less likely to the work to be halted and changed. And if um, it was less likely to meet resistance from the opposition in any council reports, etc. One of the we one of the teams that was really instrumental in working with us on this change of approach was the public health team. At the time I reported um, to the director of public health. So although I was dealing with the eviction side of unauthorised encampments, the, the public health team were really useful in getting together information around the um, social and economic disadvantages that travellers face um, nationally. A lot of the statistics are national and some of them are out of date, but it was really helpful. And they were really, and that, that data was really helpful in getting across to elected members how building a transit site could help to meet some of those, um, bridge some of those disadvantages as well. I think one of the things that does need to be remembered when we're dealing with unauthorised encampments, it's often negative behaviours that we find, although some um, are renowned to be positive. So I know there's one group, and if they've been on any of your sites, that come over from France and the first thing they do when they arrive is get the lawnmowers and the litter pickers out and they leave the land in a better condition than when they arrive. Um, so, you know, we, we there is a lot of prejudice when we're talking about travellers and travelling communities, but that like any other community, there's good and bad people in there. When we were looking at the transit site, one of the things we had to think about was what was the purpose? So I know that there's one authority where the transit site was built really as a deterrent. It, they didn't really want it to be used, but they just wanted it to be a deterrent from people from setting up an unauthorised encampment. That was not our purpose. As I say, we were definitely wanted somewhere where the travellers would want to stay, people would want to use it, and we could go a little way to meet some of those disadvantages that travelling communities face. So um, one of the families that we've had on this summer, there were two, two people within the family had to go into hospital for surgery. And so our transit site, we have a policy of a 28 day stay max. However, there is discretion and to enable those people to have the operations that they needed and the recovery time, we flex that policy and extended the stay by quite, quite a significant period. Um, I think they were probably there for over eight weeks in the end instead of four. We've had conversations, we worked with our cohesion team who's had conversations with the local community. There was opposition to the transit site from residents uh, in the area proposed, but they, I think, are coming and having some positive experiences. We've had very few complaints, really um, one, one family group, we had a complaint about noise, they were spoken to the next day, it wasn't repeated. We've had a couple where they have very small dogs which can escape under the gate. Um, they're spoken to and told they need to keep the dogs under control and within sight. 
litter, we've had a complaint about litter that was unjustified. But really, that was just general litter. It's the, the site is in a busy urban area. We've had one family that has really caused a problem where somebody from the site committed um, an assault on a local business owner and the business owner with the fear of retribution wouldn't press charges. So we work with the police and um, as soon as we had enough evidence that we knew that it was the, the people from the transit site, we revoked their permission to stay and they were evicted um, the same week. And I think that's one of our, our things, things that we're pleased about with the site. It's we can be compassionate and positive to and supportive to the families that are on there, but we can be firm and supportive to our local communities as well. Like I say, um, we also worked in the development of the site with people, representatives from the traveling communities around the facilities. And we always said we wanted a site that was nice to stay on and people wanted to stay on. And, and I think there was some fear amongst members that we were going to spend a lot of money making it all really, really beautiful with roses around the arch, um, the doorways and things. It's not, it's functional, um, but it's got toilets. Each pitch has its own toilet. And there is um, a shared male shower and a shared female shower. Looking at the units that we've actually purchased, if I was to feed back into building another one, I would say we could put, and I'll show you a picture of them shortly, we could put a shower toilet on every pitch so everybody could have their own shower toilet. We provide electricity. Now, I'm in a regional, similar to this, a regional group for unauthorised encampments, which is just the West Midlands Police Force area. And I know that neighbouring authorities on their transit sites have sometimes had problems with travellers extracting electricity. They don't provide it on their site. So they, they were f feeding cables from the gates and from um, street lamps just outside the site. So we've provided electricity hookup for each pitch and we are including the cost of the electricity in the rent to discourage um, such activity. They've got running water to each pitch and there's a, um, a drain for disposable of grey water from each pitch. We've tried to encourage, um, we've, we've made provision for recycling, but that is just not working. They just, that is something that we've given up on and we're just um, clearing waste and they do generate more waste than your regular household. Um, so that is something that, that you need to be mindful of. Um, and one of the other things I think which is helping us to make it work well is that we have um, the site management um, we've, we've contracted out to a company and one of the requirements is that they were at the beginning of a particular family stay they visit the site daily um, and once everything's settled and a relationship and trust is they can reduce that to every other day or maybe three times a week. Um, so like I say, we had the general public, we did have resistance and opposition and we did have to have um, some public meetings which were um, on via teams because it was during COVID restrictions um, to try and allay some of the fears. But actually what we're finding is the site is in the vicinity of a local parade of shops. So the local businesses are benefiting from the custom. Um, And when the first family had come to the end of their 28 day stay and were leaving, a resident spoke to the site managers um, at the time asking why they were going. And they said, oh, it's the time was up. And the residents were saying, that's a shame. There'd been no trouble. It's a shame they couldn't stay longer. So um, I think it's a success in that we have turned the mindset of local residents around. Um, the site, like I say, is in quite a busy area. I'm going to try and share my screen. Can somebody let me know if that's come through? Yeah, 
yeah we can yeah, see yeah, it so it's a very built up residential area so in the with the planning team it was clear it needed to be land that was designated for housing because that's effectively what it is it's land that has been vacant for a number of years and was quite scrubby it was protected by hoardings and we'd had problems with people breaking the hoardings um and sleeping rough intense drug using in the site of residents and things so the site of the transit site is here. And believe it or not, it is now on Street View. So you can see it's very residential. Um, but just along here, we've got local shops, post office, takeaway, laundrette, etc. Um, there's the gate and a height barrier. One of our concerns was <coughs> that you would let um, a family group on and then they'd have other people coming to join them and you wouldn't have control. So the height barrier is low enough for day to day vehicles to come and go, but too low for caravans and camper vans to gain access. So once they're on site, we can leave the main gates open, but just have the height barrier down. It has six, six pitches. Um, we've left, we had to take some trees down, but we've left a number of trees in place, which this summer turned out to be beneficial because it gave some shade from the sun. This area on the left wasn't really usable, so we've grassed that over and put a picnic bench on for them. Um, as you'll see, the fencing is open along the one side, but on um, and part way up and then at, at the back and down this side it's solid and again it was about not making them feel like nobody wants to be with them that they could that they shouldn't be seen um that they're part and that they're part of the community they're not they're not fenced off also if they're totally fenced off the risk of them getting up to um unwanted business activity is increased um so, whoops, that one, that's the, that was a picture of the site partway through construction. The paving, the, the surface is um, like a honeycomb. Don't ask me, I'm not technical on road building, but it's a honeycomb that then has got shingle that compressed into it. Um, that's the site now occupied. So as I'm clicking on pictures, the different pictures popping up from the one I'm clicking on. Nope. Come on. Let's try. Right, so that's the toilet blocks. So each of these cabins has a toilet and sink in it. Oh, for goodness sake. What's going on? Yeah, so each of these has a toilet and sink in it and one is dedicated to each pitch. They're all together in a row at one end of the site but they're dedicated. Let's do it this way. So one, each one is dedicated to the pitch and then at each end there is one that has a shower, a toilet and a sink in it. And there's one of those for females, one for males. Um, it, like I said, each pitch has its own electricity supply, its own water tap, and waste disposal. Yeah. 
that, that's where the the caravan pitch is marked out. There's, there's space for each each caravan. Each pitch has space for one caravan and two vehicles. And that's the site that's um, fully occupied. So there's three caravans fit along the front and then three up the side. Um, I had to be careful. I, um, so, uh, as you know, many travellers are quite shy. Um, so I did have permission to take a picture, but I was careful to try and take one without any um, people any members of the family on um, the guy who's back. You can see he's one of the site managers. So this is back, so that's OK. There was another picture I was going to show you, but I, I'm conscious of time. So I'm not and the fact that a picture viewing isn't working properly. So I'll leave it at that. So any, and I'm sorry, that's a real race through. But if there's any questions, happy to. Take them. Thanks, Thank Lorraine, so that's much, fantastic. Yeah. Are you still there, Liz? Yes. Yes, yes, just about. I'm conscious I've got another meeting in a bit. Um, have we got any questions? There's nothing in the chat. Um, no. We did specifically have a member who was really interested, so I'm not sure if they're in, in the room today, but we'll make the recording available for them, Lorraine, if you're happy with that. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that will be really helpful yeah. for people. And I'm sure... Um, like I say, I'm in the, we have a, a forum for the the seven authorities, Walsall, Dudley, Burn, um, Walsall, Dudley, Sandwell, Wolverhampton, Birmingham, Solihull and Coventry, who are in the um, West Midlands Police Force area. And we chat a lot. We don't always agree on everything, but it is useful. We do chat and discuss different approaches and, and things. Um, but for the, the guys that are not in those areas, I would, if you don't already get to know your enforcement teams and and share um, and chat to them and and share information i'm sure they're happy to to, to talk to you thank you very much okay liz um unfortunately i think we've got to close it there we had got a member from um a member who wanted to ask a question but i can put that on the newsletter if that's all right liz because i'm aware you've got another meeting yeah, that would be great. Thanks, Alison. Appreciate okay. that. That's great. Okay, so thanks everybody for joining us and um, yeah, have a good Christmas. <laughs> See you in the new year. Yeah, thanks very much. See All you right. in the new year. Cheers bye then. then. Bye bye. bye, -bye.